All right, looks like we have a fair amount of people inside right now. So welcome everyone. Um, before we get started, I want to kick it over to Maxine to uh, welcome us. Hi, Maxine. Hi, Aaron. Yes, welcome. And thank you all for coming today for the three that matter to me. Uh, this is a great way for all of our communities to feel connected. My name is Maxine Spencer, and I'm a resident of the terraces at San Joaquin Gardens at Fresno, California, which is just in the center of California almost. I'm honored to be the co-host with John <clears throat> Cochran today. And when I said yes to the invitation, it was because of books. Uh, to age well, those books tell me, do something new and do something scary. This qualifies for both. Uh, we are now in a large group, but later there will be three breakout sessions. Uh, you can mute in this large group and unmute in the smaller sessions as you participate. From John, you will hear about the three books that have influenced him as a person. And later in the breakout session, you will have a chance to share your similar experiences with books that matter to you with other residents across the country. Throughout, you can think about books you may want to recommend to John. My own experience, is, experience with books is ongoing. <clears throat> Tuesday, I finished a book on my Kindle, and that afternoon, I started another book from our library. I have three hardbound books to finish by February 21st when the uh, county library comes to pick them up. My love of reading may have started before the fourth grade, but that trip to the little Carnegie Library with my class is still vivid in my memory. Just seeing those shelves for the first time full of books <clears throat> was overwhelming. And I checked out my first Nancy Drew book with my new library card. I've had a card uh, all my life since then in multiple towns. And now it's time to go back to John, which you have seen. And John has always shown an interest in knowing and connecting with us. Take it away, John. Maxine, thank you so much and good morning and good afternoon. It is so good to see all of you here. I'm so excited to be here to talk about three books that matter to me. Um, and Maxine, I loved your story about your excitement walking into the library because I share that excitement. And when I moved to California, I went into the Pasadena Public Library and, and I got my library card. And only people who love libraries and love books will understand this. But I was so excited and so happy to have this card because I know that books open up a new world for many of us. And it is uh, something I've had since childhood. So let me start by taking you to my childhood I'm eight or nine years old, and it's winter in Springfield, Illinois, where I grew up. Uh, it is uh, snowing outside. The trees are covered with snow. And I'm sitting on the floor of the bedroom I share with my two older brothers uh, with a blanket around me and my feet over the register that blows the hot air that heats our house. And I'm reading a biography, a children's biography of Abraham Lincoln. And I'm so excited every time that the heat comes on and the air starts to blow because all of a sudden I imagine myself sitting in front of a fireplace as I'm reading Abraham Lincoln did as he learned to read and write and, and do his schoolwork. And I was instantly transported from Springfield, Illinois, from my bedroom in our split level home at 20 Sunnyside Drive into a one room log cabin in Kentucky where the 16th president of the United States was just becoming the person he would uh, grow up to be. And I realized at that moment, the power that books have, not just to inform us, not just to inspire us, but the power they have to transport us to another place. And that for me was absolutely magical. I just loved those times. And I still love reading for that time when all of a sudden you can close out everything else that's going on in the world and magically appear someone somewhere else, magically stand in someone else's shoes, magically experience something you would never be able to experience. And one of the many things I love about reading is if a hundred people share a book, this is why book clubs are so popular, 
A uh, hundred people take away something different. A hundred people hear something different, see something different, experience something different. And sharing all of that is just where we find our common humanities, where we get to know one another, where we get to know ourselves, where we get to figure out our place in the world. And so books for me have long been just a source of joy and fascination. Uh, Maxine, you mentioned reading on your Kindle. And I have to admit, I read most of my books today on my iPad. Uh, and I do that because I read four or five books at a time. So I read some more serious books. I read some less serious books. I read books about business. I read books about life. And, and I find that for me, uh, because I like reading so much, keeping different books enables me to jump in wherever I need to be, wherever I, I want to be for that moment. It keeps it interesting. But because I travel, I can't drag books around with me the way I used to and the way I like. And what I miss, and I'll bet everyone on this Zoom understands this, I miss the tactile feel of holding a book. I miss the feel of the pages as they turn. I miss the smells of a, I, I just miss all of it. And, and so I've kind of reluctantly gone to the electronic version and they're great for a lot of things. I love to crawl into bed at night and read. Having an electronic book is fabulous for that. But and you'll see me reference a few of these as we go along. I still love the physical books. So my lifelong interest uh, really started from childhood, but it started earlier than the, the moment I just described reading this children's biography of Abraham Lincoln. It started for me with four magic words as I was being read to. And I wonder if any of you on the Zoom can guess what those four magic words are that entranced me as a child and continue to, to entrance many of us as adults. And I heard it, somebody got it exactly right. It took about half a nanosecond, once upon a time. Aren't those the magical words that just get us ready to go somewhere special, right? My ears perk up, I pay a little closer attention, I lean in and I get ready to hear a wonderful story. And I think that of all the gifts I got from my parents, perhaps the, the best gift I got was the gift of, of a love of reading and a love of stories uh, because they are so powerful. And so I want to start by talking about, when I talk about three books that matter to me, I want to start by uh, talking about a children's book that mattered to me when I was a child, but also matters to me to this day. I love children's books for lots of different reasons. One, they're, they're kind of simple, compressed storytelling, right? So let's face Face it, at my age, I can actually get through a children's book uh, in one sitting, which is uh, something I don't do with most of my other books. But I love the simplified, compressed storytelling. I love the economy of the storytelling. There's no room for fluff or extra or extraneous. You really have to get to the core of the story and get there in a really powerful way, in a really simple way. I admit I even like the drawings because I compare them to how I'm picturing something in my own head. So that's kind of fun. I've loved them when I was a kid. I still love them as an adult. Uh, and I love children's books for a couple of reasons. One is, of course, they have to work and appeal to children. They have to be an engaging story. They have to be a storyline that captures people, that holds their imaginations, that allows them to read and see themselves. And, and, and that's key if you're going to engage that core audience. But the best children's books also have powerful messages that resonate just as powerfully for adults. So one of the questions I'm going to have for you as we go into our breakout session, we're not going there just yet, is can you remember a children's book, a childhood book that was especially important to you? I'd love to have you put that in the chat. We'll talk about that when we get into our breakout rooms. But one of those very special books for me um, is a book called The Velveteen Rabbit. Peggy, I see you laughing. I'll bet you're familiar with it. I see a few of you laughing and you're laughing. I see a few other people laughing. You know this book. It's a great children's book. Even better than that, it's a great adult book. If you haven't read it in a while, let me reacquaint you with a couple of passages. If you've never read it, I really hope you will go to a library somewhere and pick up a copy of this. It is just a profoundly important book. And as I looked at my book again this morning, I wondered where I got in this particular copy. And inside the front page, you won't be able to see this, but it says, return to Fourth Presbyterian Church. <laughs> so, so apparently I was stealing children's books from my church in Chicago. Don't tell them. Um, hopefully I made a good pledge that year, but apparently that's where I got this copy of The Velveteen Rabbit. 
And the subtitle of The Velveteen Rabbit is How Toys Become Real. And you'll see why that's so important to me in, in just a minute. But it's a story, of course, of, of a childhood, of, of a children's toy, a toy rabbit, and how that toy became real. And so you can imagine right away for a kid how enthralling this is. If you've ever watched a two, three, four, five-year-old haul around their stuffed animal, that's not a stuffed animal to them. That's real, right? That is absolutely real to them. And so that story of, to them of how to toys become real really resonates but it also resonates for adults. And I'll share with you why that resonates so powerfully for me. And then we want to hear from you about the stories that resonated with you. So allow me, since this is a book club, to do a little reading from the book. There once was a velveteen rabbit. And in the beginning, he was really splendid. He was fat and bunchy, as a rabbit should be. His coat was spotted brown and white. He had real thread whiskers and his ears were lined with pink satin, right? So you've got this wonderful image right off the bat of this kind of picture perfect rabbit, this picture perfect toy, everything in place, everything the way it should be. And the book goes on to tell the story of how the rabbit feels a little left out by the more sophisticated toys, the toys with buzzers and handles and, and pull tabs and, and things that, that make noise and so he begins to, to feel shunned by some of the other toys, feel pushed to the side, which again, if you're a kid, haven't, haven't all kids felt that way, right? So all of a sudden they can relate to how this, this rabbit is feeling. And if you're an adult, you've almost certainly experienced what it means to be the outsider, what it means to be pushed aside, what it means to be overlooked. And so again, these books work at two different levels. And so the rabbit starts having a conversation with a toy horse that's also part of this kid's toys. The toy horse had lived longer in the nursery than any of the others. He was so old that his brown coat was bald in patches and showed the seams underneath. And most of the hair in his tail had been pulled out. He was wise for he had seen a long succession of mechanical toys arrive to boast and swagger and pass away and knew that they were only toys and they would never turn into anything else. For nursery magic is very strange and wonderful. And only those playthings that are old and wise and experienced understand about it. What is real? Asked the rabbit one day. Does it mean having things that buzz inside you and a stick out handle? Real isn't how you are made, said the toy horse. It's a thing that happens to you. When a child loves you for a long, long time, not just to play with, but really loves you, then you become real. Does it hurt? Asked the rabbit. Sometimes, said the toy horse, for he was always truthful. When you are real, you don't mind being hurt. Does it happen all at once, like being wound up or bit by bit? It doesn't happen all at once, said the toy horse. You become. It takes a long time. That's why it doesn't often happen to people who, an interesting choice of words, isn't it? The author says it doesn't happen to people, but weren't we talking about toys? It doesn't often happen to people who break easily or have sharp edges or who have to be carefully kept. Generally, by the time you are real, most of your hair has been loved off, your eyes drop out and you get loose in the joints and very shabby. But these things don't matter at all because once you are real, you can't be ugly except to people who don't understand. What a great book. What a great message for kids. But what a more powerful message for adults. You see, the title is The Velveteen Rabbit, How Toys Become Real. But like the best of children's books, this is really the story of how people become real. Velveteen Rabbit, one of my three books that matter to me. And now, Maxine, I think we have some questions for the audience and we'll send people into a breakout room. Um, yes, so the first breakout room, the two questions <clears throat> that you will be discussing. One, what book from your childhood inspired you to read and why? The second question, what experience, uh, what experience ignited your passion for reading? 
And uh, so remember, now is the time to unmute so you can uh, discuss. I'll see you back here later. Well, I hope you had as a, a good a discussion in your uh, breakout group as we did in ours. It was limited, but a really powerful uh, discussion about how books uh, help us build empathy, understanding. Uh, someone shared the story of, of being slower to learn to love reading and how it only takes that one book that captures your imagination, that one book that allows you to see yourself in it, to capture your imagination, draw you in and create that lifelong love affair with, with learning and with books. And I think it's a great point to understand that while many of us got hooked as children, not everybody does. And if you didn't get hooked as a kid, you can still get hooked as an adult and get the same joy and the same purpose out of, out of books. So what I would love you to do is use the chat feature. If you have a favorite children's book, if you have a book that you give to grandchildren or grandnieces and nephews, uh, share it in the chat. I'd love to see what those are. We'd love to gather that. Uh, now I'm going to switch gears, though, as I we talk about three books that matter to me. I wanted to start with children's because, again, they, they are how I got hooked into a love of reading. Uh, there's still something I enjoy. That's still the primary gift I share with uh, grand nieces and nephews. But I want to shift to business books, books that have shaped uh, my career, books that shape how I lead human good. Uh, and hope that might be a little bit interesting for you. And I would invite you to start thinking about books that perhaps helped shape your careers and your vocations, whether those were paid uh, vocations, whether that was work inside the home, whether it was volunteer effort somewhere, but books that have helped shape your understanding of the world and, and helped shape your understanding of your career. Not surprisingly, I do a fair amount of, of reading for business. And one of the things I try to do as, as, I, as I think about uh, business books is one of the hard parts about leadership is understanding your own situation, understanding the, the context within which you're operating and the forces that are being, being put upon you as, as, a, as an uh, organization. And so I find it, it's helpful to step outside of our field, outside of my day-to-day -day responsibilities, if you will, to get some of that perspective. And what I look for in business books are books that allow me to gather information synthesize information that at first glance may not appear to have a whole lot of connection to what we do with human good, but then apply those principles and learnings uh, to human good. So uh, you know, where do you start? Where do you find those books? Well, as Billy Joel said, uh, sometimes I go to extremes. So I like to read about success stories and believe it or not, I like to read about failures uh, because both can be really instructive uh, lessons for leadership and, and for organizations and companies. Uh, I will say the success stories are far more fun to read, but sometimes the failure stories are, are really, really compelling because you learn lessons about how once great companies fell apart, how they lost their way, what were the mistakes that were made in leadership and, and in execution that, that caused them to, to slip away both have lessons. In, in the case of failure, it's often about hubris and lack of focus and lack of courage. And of course, in success stories, it's often just the opposite of that. It is stories of courage and clarity. Often it's stories about uh, humility, humility and leadership, uh, humility and in, in understanding, flexibility in terms of how we uh, approach our field, uh, a willingness to to embrace ideas that might be difficult, but might be necessary. Uh, so overall, I would say, well, I read both extremes uh, and I think both are important. Success is obviously a lot more fun. And so I want to focus on a success story that I've read recently. It's a company I focus on a lot. And I think it has a lot to say about human good and who we are and where we need to be going. So that success story, if I, if I was to ask you for iconic companies that, that have stood the test of time, certainly one of those that would be on many of our lists would be the Walt Disney Company. Next year, they will celebrate their 100th anniversary. And I will point out that very few companies actually make it intact to their 100th anniversary. And very few of those that make it to 100 get to 100 at the very top of their game. And that is absolutely the Walt Disney Company. When you look at media content companies, entertainment companies, 
there's Walt Disney, and then there are a whole bunch of, of also rands in many different respects. Now, it may look like success has just come naturally to the Walt Disney Company. There's just been a linear path of, of continued success and relevance in the market. Not exactly true. And so when you look at that company, uh, I, I've studied their, their success over many years. I've looked at their strategies. I've looked at how they ex execute. I look at, at some of the mistakes they've made as a company. And by the way, successful companies make mistakes. That's an important learning. Um, but the uh, now just retired uh, chairman and chief executive officer of the Walt Disney Company, Bob Iger, wrote a biography of his time in leadership in, in media. It's called um, um, The Ride of a Lifetime. Right. And it talks about the fact that he just can't believe his good fortune at leading one of the iconic companies of America. And by the way, he was a fairly improbable leader. If you if you don't know about Bob Iger, he was a long shot to get the job. Most people didn't expect much out of him. Uh, many people thought the company needed to turn to an outsider to run it. He gets the job in over 15 years. He delivers year after year after year of real success. And throughout the book, there are all kinds of lessons that, that apply to human good that we can take away and I can take away, apply to my own leadership and apply to the circumstances of our own company. And so I invite you to read that book and think to yourself, what are some of those parallels? Why does John read this book? And what does he see that connects to human good? Well, some of those things are that despite outside appearances, the Walt Disney Company was facing enormous disruption in their field. There was enormous change going on in the media world, and the Walt Disney Company had to navigate that change. They had to disrupt their own business to create continued vitality and relevance. And while that may sound easy, it is the hardest thing in the world for a successful company to actually disrupt its own business and, and prepare itself for the future. If you want proof of that, look no further than Kodak. They could not disrupt their own business despite the fact that they had all the keys to the future in digital technology. So the Walt Disney Company was able to do that. The book concludes with lessons to lead by. And I wanna share just a few of these with you and talk about why they resonated with me and how I think they apply to human good and how they've influenced my own leadership at human good. Bob says, to tell great stories, you need great talent. That may sound obvious, but, you know, so many times we forget that our success as a company starts with the great talent that we have. I've talked a lot about with people who have heard me speak. This is the best team I have worked with in my career. That's not an accident. And it is the single most important recipe for our continued vitality and success as an organization. We need smart, creative, passionate caring, thoughtful people. We have them by the droves. And when I talk about being an optimist as a leader, it's often because we have such a strong foundation of people who care about our field. But this book reinforced, and as I looked at the decisions the Walt Disney Company has made in hiring, I realized that talent was put number one for them, and it was foundational to their long-term success. One quick story I'll share from the book, I hired a guy to leave the movie studio at Walt Disney. And when he hired somebody, he hired a 70-year-old to come in and lead the studio. I think Alan Horn might have been, yeah, maybe he was 68 when he started, 70. He was somewhere in there. He'd been fired from his previous job despite a long track record of success because his previous company thought he might be too old uh, and it might be time for him to retire. And Bob Iger looked at Alan Horn. He said, well, wait a minute. There's great talent with more to give, more to share, and a passion for doing that work. Brought him into Disney, and the, the story is he spent 10 years. Every one of those 10 years, Disney led the world in global box office, string after string after string of, of success due to hiring the right talent, placing the bet on the right people. Great message for us. Bob talks a lot about now more than ever the need to innovate or die. And he puts it just that starkly in the book, innovate or die. That sounds good. We all want to be innovators. But, you know, the fact is it's scary. It's uncertain. There, there are bets that go wrong. You've got to be willing to fail. 
And most companies, despite the fact they talk about being willing to innovate, aren't willing to innovate at all because they're afraid. They're afraid of failure. They're afraid of, of bruising their knees. And so they play it safe. And in playing it safe, they go off the rails. Now, it doesn't happen immediately, but it does happen. So again, a great parallel lesson coming out of the Walt Disney Company. Uh, he talks about, it's about creating an environment in which people refuse to accept mediocrity. Good enough is not good enough. With you know a few more resources, with a little more effort, if you can get from good to great, push it just a little bit harder. And Bob did that consistently throughout his 15 years in leadership as the CEO of the Walt Disney Company and the results speak for themselves. And I see this with our own team members all the time. And the good news is I don't have to prod people to excellence. They prod themselves. That's why I'm so optimistic about the future for our organization. Because I got a whole team of people who refuse to accept good enough. Who, who don't want to quit until the last possible minute till we have to stop pushing because we don't settle for mediocrity. And so many companies do. So many companies will say, ah, we're good enough. We're okay for now. We can get by with that. Getting by with that is not a recipe for long-term success. So those stories really resonated with me. Bob talks about too often, we lead from a place of fear rather than courage stubbornly trying to build a bulwark to protect old models that can't possibly survive the sea change. Our field is changing. The field of aging is changing and it's changing rapidly. And I see as I, as I scan uh, across organizations and I talk with my counterparts, I see two schools of thought. I see people who are excited by that change, who are embracing it, who wrestle every day to understand it and, and find ways to be relevant and, and real for the missions they, they serve. And then I find a lot of organizations who are just clinging on for dear life, right? They just don't want anything to change. They want it to be like it was five or 10 years ago, and they want to just preserve the status quo. The problem is you can't preserve the status quo when there's disruption coming. So how do you navigate those changes? The Walt Disney Company gives us all kinds of, of examples for that. Uh, he writes about long shots are usually not as long as they seem. With enough thoughtfulness and commitment, the boldest ideas can be executed. I see that every day. That's so right. We, we tend to tell ourselves horror stories of why something won't work. We talk ourselves out of everything that might be possible. And in doing that, we talk ourselves out of living our mission in the fullest, most dynamic way possible. And I refuse to let that happen for human good. And the people I work with every day refuse to let that happen for human good. And last, Bob writes, if you're in the business of making something, be in the business of making something great. That so resonates with me. That's why I'm here. That's why my colleagues are here. Are we perfect? Are we great yet? Of course we're not but we're on a path to that. That's what motivates us. That's what motivates me. So when you read that book, if you read The Right of a Lifetime, you'll see why that book informs my leadership of human good, why I find that so relevant to who we are as an organization. So, so Maxine, I think if I'm right, we're going to break and go back into our breakout groups and talk about uh, books that have been relevant to our professional lives. Am I right? The questions to, to think about on this second breakout session, is there a particular book that shaped your life? Is there a book that you return to for reflection or guidance? And please remember to unmute in this next section. Well, we never have enough time for these discussions. And, and I know, let me see, I'm trying to roughly keep track of time. All right. See, this is my big fear when I'm being invited to talk about books is I'm only given an hour to talk about three books that matter to me. And this is one of those sessions that I could go on for hours talking about this. And I would love to engage in conversations with all of you. And by the way, at the end of this, you're going to be asked uh, and, and tasked with some homework. And that is to either put into the chat or send an email and you'll see the email uh, on your screen at the end of our time together of a book you would recommend that I read. I try to read at least one book a week. Uh, I probably make it on an annual basis. I don't make it uh, necessarily every single week, uh, but I try. If nothing else, I at least uh, make a stab at reading a number of different books. So if I don't get one completed, I, I at least make progress. Uh, 
Well, I'm going to end my, my time together talking about three books that matter to me uh, with a book I never wanted to read. And, and it's a book that people kept suggesting I, suggesting I read. Uh, and, and it's a book called Tuesdays with Maury. Some of you may be familiar with this book. People kept giving me this book and, and saying, hey, you know, I, I really need to read this, John. You need to read this. You'll love it. Uh, it's an uplifting book about dying, which uh, doesn't that just sound compelling? And, and so it sat on my shelf for years. And I thought, you know, I don't want to read this book. And then they kept telling me, oh, it's a feel good book. You'll love it. I hate feel good books. I, I find them treatly and, 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 and just somehow a, a little off putting. Uh, mostly, I just like using the word treacly uh, on a Zoom because you don't get to do that every day. And so this book sat, literally just sat on my bookshelf for years and I, and I, and I didn't want to read it. Now it actually sits on my coffee table. And I will tell you, this book, much like Velveteen Rabbit, and I think you'll see the parallels between the two, which is why I chose those two, have real parallels about how I see the world, how I see people, and how I respond to people. It's the story uh, written by Mitch Album, a sports writer, talking about the visits he had with his uh, college professor mentor, Maury Schwartz, as Maury Schwartz was dying of ALS, or more commonly referred to as Lou Gehrig's disease. And Maury shares with, with Mitch uh, the experiences he's going through um, as he, as he battles ALS and, and as he learns to adjust. And so I want to read just a few, this is a book club, so I get to read. I want to read just a little bit from the book and talk about why this informs my thinking uh, about life, but certainly about my work. When a colleague at Brandeis died suddenly of a heart attack, Maury went to his funeral. He came home depressed. What a waste, he said. All those people saying all those wonderful things and Irv never got to hear any of it. And I read that and I thought, boy, isn't that true? Isn't that a great reminder to tell the people we love and care about that we love and care about them? Tell the people we admire, not just that we admire them, but why we admire them, what they mean to us. You know, we don't need to wait until people are dead to talk nice about them. We can actually do that right now. We could do that when we get off this Zoom call. And that may be one of my charges to you as we end our time together. He goes on to write about an appearance that he had with Ted Koppel on Nightline, if you remember that show. Uh, Maury was interviewed by Ted Koppel. Um, and the first exchange I just thought was interesting is Ted said, now let me ask you something. Have you ever seen my program? Maury replied, twice, I think. Twice, that's all? Well, don't feel bad. I've only seen Oprah once. That has nothing to do with uh, what he wrote, but I actually enjoyed that. So while he's been interviewed, he said, Ted, this is Maury talking. When all this started, I asked myself, am I going to withdraw from the world like most people do, or am I going to live with my ALS? I decided I'm going to live, or at least try to live, the way I want, with dignity, with courage, with humor, with composure. And there's a lot about that that I just loved. And talking about the fact that he mentions you're going to try to live. Because some days, doesn't it feel like that's what we're doing? Some days it's just like, well, I'm not trying to get through the day. I'm trying, trying to live. Uh, some days that's the best we can do, but it's a choice we make. It's a choice Maury made. And it's a choice he made with really powerful consequences. He ends talking about this. He talks about the dependency that came as his body failed him. And he relied on others to provide the most personal care. It took some getting used to, Maury admitted, the most personal and basic things had now been taken from him. Going to the bathroom, wiping his nose, washing his private parts. With the exception of breathing and swallowing his food, he was dependent on others for nearly everything. I asked Maury how he managed to stay positive through that. Mitch, it's funny, he replied. I'm an independent person, so my inclination was to fight all of this being helped from the car, having someone else dress me, I felt a little ashamed because our culture tells us we should be ashamed if we can't wipe our own behind. But then I figured, forget what the culture says. And you know what? The strangest thing, I began to enjoy my dependency. Now I enjoy when they turn me over on my side and rub cream on my behind so I don't get sores or when they wipe my brow or they massage my legs, I revel in it. I close my eyes and soak it up. And it seems very familiar to me. 
It's like going back to being a child again, someone to bathe you, someone to lift you, someone to wipe you. We all know how to be a child. It's inside all of us. For me, it's just a rem remembering how to enjoy it. The truth is when our mothers held us, rocked us, stroked our heads, none of us ever got enough of that. And I think that's such a powerful lesson of perspective, right? We become dependent, we become needy. We're so culturally attuned to not asking for help and frankly being ashamed if we have to ask for help. And Maury starts buying into that. He starts signing up for that. He's embarrassed with people helping him. And finally, he comes to this point of realization that it's a choice he gets to make. He doesn't have to accept that as the reality. He can reject what the culture has told him about dependency and instead revel in the love that is being showered on him uh, while his needs are met. I was remembering as I read that, uh, visiting my niece when she was uh, just a little over one, she had learned to walk. She was running all over the house. Uh, after dinner, she would head to the bathroom for tub town. She would go to the bathroom and then she would uh, get cleaned up and then she would get put in the tub and, and bathe and, and get ready for bed and be wrapped in a, in a towel. And whenever we were visiting, she insisted that anybody who was at the house, and, and I mean, anybody who was visiting at the house had to witness this, right? She, she wanted everybody possible with her at tub town. And that includes sitting on the toilet. No one had ever told her she should be embarrassed or ashamed. Uh, she wanted everybody to see this miracle that was happening while she was on the toilet, getting cleaned up, getting put in the bathtub, getting fresh water from the spigot poured over her head while she blew bubbles. She wanted to make sure you witnessed all of it. Uh, and then she would get out of the tub, get a warm towel wrapped around her, get dried off, and then run around the house naked as a jade bird. And the only thing she loved more than having her Aunt Lisi and Uncle Johnny there to witness would be having anybody else there. The neighbors down the hall, all of you on this Zoom, the more the merrier. She was just thrilled to revel in that love that was being showered on her. And as I read Maury's description, I realized that's exactly what she was experiencing. And somewhere we forget that. Somewhere we forget what it means to be loved. We see people as broken. We see people as dependent. We see people as needy. And somehow we're told we should be ashamed of that. Maury helped shift my understanding to realize we can change the script on that. It doesn't have to be that way. I think we are close to out of time, but we have one more quick breakout. Eric, am I right on that? Yes, correct. Yes, correct. All right. So let's do one more quick breakout. We'll come back and wrap things up. Hopefully you can stick around for a few extra minutes and we will uh, conclude our time together. And Maxine, let me cue it over to you. What, uh, what are we talking about in group three? Okay. Uh, what book do you recommend to everybody to read? Number two, what book do you take with you on re or return to? And three, what book have you given as a gift? the most. All right. Lots to talk about. We'll see you in a few minutes. Well, I knew I wouldn't be able to do this in under an hour. And of course, I, 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 I failed as I knew I would. Uh, Maxine, you had an impossible task to try to keep me on task and on time, but we did pretty well. We're only seven minutes over. I think we started a couple of minutes late. Well, I want to thank all of you for joining me. Thank you for allowing me to share a little bit about my love of books, what they mean to me. Maxine, thank you for sharing your own story about how you were introduced to the library and you saw a world open up in front of you. In the space of a room, we can open up the world. And isn't that what we get with books? Uh, I read a statistic yesterday that was a little disheartening. I think Gallup did, does a poll every year about the number of books people are reading. Uh, and last year was the lowest number of books uh, read uh, uh, in the history in which they've, they've been uh, gathering this data. And I hope we can turn that around. I hope we can encourage people to read because it really is our window to the world. This is how we understand one another, understand ourselves, understand our connection to one another uh, and, and, and how, we, how we need to, to behave and operate and live. So again, thank you for sharing so much of, of that with me, allowing me to share. I do have a request to make. As you get off this, you'll, you'll see a, a email contact Eric's gonna put up on the screen. I would love to have your suggestions for books that I should read. Uh, 
Carol in my group had uh, I, at least two suggestions for me. So it says which book. Notice it says books, plural. You can give me more than one suggestion. I love to read. Uh, I may not be able to respond to every one of the suggestions, but I will promise you I'll look at every one of them and, and that will be my reading list for the next year. Thank you so much for sharing some time together. I have enjoyed being with every one of you. So go out, stay safe, hold to the good and tell someone that you love them today. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, John. This was wonderful. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, John.